Hey, welcome to the Grow People podcast uh, with Pastor Jason. Yes, that is me. Lead pastor of Revolution Church uh, <laughs> going on 12 years. 12 years in January, that's yep. right. Yep. yep, pretty exciting. Uh, my name is David Stein. I'm the campus pastor at our Canton location, and the purpose of the Grow People podcast is to help grow people. And what we have found over the first nine episodes, uh, people are having fun, they're enjoying it, and some are saying it's like getting two messages in the week that the podcast drops. That's good. I mean, I hope I hope two messages is good. Yeah. That and that was more the, is not always better. So that's <laughs> what I'm saying. <laughs> and that was the purpose, maybe to go a little deeper than we went on Sunday, or even go completely off the topic of Sunday. Oh, it definitely was the purpose. Yeah. To to dig into things maybe we didn't get into the message and then to deal with maybe subjects that we are haven't dealt with in the message, but this is a better format to do it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, before we get started, uh, there have been a lot of rumors flying around. There uh, have been. Yeah, there have been. <laughs> and, and depending what, what kind of rumors, depending where you get your news, uh, depends on on what you've heard. So I'm just going to ask you, as, as lead pastor, is there any truth that you have been waiting to plant the next campus based upon the multiplication plan of Whataburger? <laughs> I mean, that's the rumor I'm hearing. Uh, well, if if it's not, it should be. Yeah, <laughs> if there's not a plan, then we should, especially since it's coming to Woodstock next. They so. keep they keep creeping up 575 yeah, on, on 92. Yeah. How many people texted you about that? I get texts uh, almost weekly about it. it. When there's like some update, like last week, the the city of Woodstock just approved the Waterburg location on 92, so I got text about it. Um, whenever it was announced, I got text about it. And then people will text me um, saying, hey, the first Whataburger is on me, you know. So I'm just going to let about 100 different people think that them taking me is the first <laughs> one. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. No, I have a whole, and I've said this before, uh, on my phone, I have, you know, in maps you can create folders. Mm -hmm. So I have a whole folder of Whataburger locations. I can just click that and all the Whataburger locations in the southeast come up. And the same with Bucky's. I have a whole Bucky's folder. I can click that, and all the Bucky's in the southeast come up. So, if you look at that from a multiplication strategy, it might be a great idea. Just mm -hmm. put a put a church everywhere. There's a yeah, water burger. Yeah, we, we used to base it on where our people were, but you yeah. know, we, we may have to change that. <laughs> Just base it where water burger or Bucky, and it is Bucky's. I watched a clip the other day. I don't know if you've seen this. It's, no, it's I heresy. Not. This lady. It actually made the way I found out about it is. A text. Uh, there's a magazine called Texas Monthly. Did an article on it. There's a lady that went to Bucky's for the first time and documented it on TikTok or something. And she walked in and she said, "We're here at Busey's." <sighs> <laughs> so Texas Texas Monthly did an article about it about how all Texas all Texans, you know, cringed when we heard that. Oh. Like, I've never heard anyone say Busey's no before. No. It's Bucky's. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't they look at the logo? And think. Well, oh. here's the other thing. She walked in and she goes, "There's the gopher." Yeah, with buck teeth. Yeah, it's not a gopher. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beaver. It's a beaver. Uh, we we'll um, call them gopher nuggets. Yeah. So. Mm. Yeah, okay. So anyway. All right. Um, it's all about the ketchup. Uh, end of year. Here we go. Uh, we are actually uh, recording this just prior to the Christmas gatherings. Uh, but in the message last weekend, part three of leading a legacy. Which, by the way, if you have not watched all three episodes of episodes, episodes, <laughs> <what am> I, <laughs> if you have not seen all three messages from yeah. Leading a Legacy, what are we Netflix? <laughs> we've said <laughs> we've said this before. Um, this just wasn't a okay. We're going to take a break in John, and we're going to drop something in for a few weeks before Christmas. Mm. This was an intentional on your heart for twenty two months kind of thing. Where finally it was okay. This is what this house needs to hear uh, for the next five to 10 years. Yeah, I hope so. It, Cause it, yeah, it's definitely was something that was on my heart. As I've said many times, personally, just thinking about my son leaving and seasons and my own life. And then, yeah, coming out of COVID to the point of like, man, we really do need to think about our legacy and, and what type of legacy are we, le we leaving as a church and then as individuals, as a part of the church. And so, yeah, I hope it is a message series uh, with messages, not episodes, that does become transformational in people's lives because uh, this is it's always a great time at the end of a year, at the beginning of a new one, to be introspective 
Um, and so that's always a good practice, but I think the concept of, yeah, I don't need to just think about what I did this year, what I'm doing next year. I need to think deeper about my legacy of my life and what I, the, the type of life I'm leading, the, the way of life that I have. Um, and anytime we go through such a crisis like we've gone through, if again, if we can't learn how to be introspective as a result of that, mm -hmm. then I don't know what it's going to take. As you took a look at Jeremiah chapter six, uh, this was a very practical way to end the series um, where I, I think everybody was affected by each of the three messages in, in different ways. There were a lot of tears, a lot of guys coming up after messages mm -hmm. crying, um, me included. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, But the way that this series concluded in the practicality of how to live our lives mm -hmm. I think that's a go-to to pull off the shelf all the time. Yeah, I hope so, because that's what I wanted it to be. I wanted it to be practical, because again, you know, as we, the first two weeks, we were really talking more, you know, theoretical, trying to get people to think, you know, about the effect of their life, about the patterns of their life. And I wanted to try to leave it as practically as I could to say, okay, I'm ready to create a different legacy now, what do I need to do? Yeah. And so as I said in the message, I was originally, and I love acronyms, I was trying to come up with a phrase, you know, um, and I was like, man, it just, it's not fitting. And then when I read in Jeremiah 6, 16, it just jumped, I mean, it, call it smart, call it wise, or call it a sickness, I don't know. <laughs> but it just jumped out. I saw, uh, I was like, oh, there's Stan, look, ask, what is, and it was the acronym SLAW. And so, it just became kind of funny, and, and I felt like our church felt like it was funny. At least they laughed. Um, oh no, no, they thought it was funny. Yeah, and then, and then as you got into it, it was like, ooh, oh, that's good. Yeah, well, and that's and that's where all I, I mean, it's the word of God. That's why it's good. You know, all I did was put it in a in a funny word in slaw, <clears throat> which I don't know if that's sacrilegious or not. I don't know if God was like, oh gosh, you know, there he goes again. Um, <laughs> But, but, you know, we are in the South, and we like barbecue and so coleslaw, so it was just, you know, people, you know, it became a catchy thought. But, yeah, that verse, um, it, it, and I remember I heard it when I was probably, when, definitely when I was younger, maybe in college, and I just remember thinking then, oh, wow, that's something I need to do. Um, I need to really take this advice of this verse. And so as I was thinking about how to wrap this up again, that the practical advice of the word just jumped out, you know, and this verse is uh, Jeremiah six sixteen. thus says the Lord. Mm -hmm. and, and I love how you unpacked thus says the Lord, because normally when that happens, it's, it's some type of firm instruction. Yeah. And, uh, you related it to the fact that what, what if God wasn't speaking to us? Absolutely. Yeah. Because again, you know, so much of, a, uh, not to take too much of a derail here, but this is probably a good thought to dig into, but so many times we always feel like, like there's a, there is a revolt right now against authority. Mm -hmm. um, no doubt. Like whether it is the, the concept of postmodernism or the, the, what a lot of people are doing now and deconstructing, the idea is everybody that's in authority or the thought process behind it is everybody that's in authority Everything they say to me is a power play. Mm -hmm. And what that means is they are saying it to me because they just want something from me. So therefore, there is a movement, there is a spirit within our culture right now that says, well, anybody in authority that's saying something to me, whatever they're saying is, is negative. And so we apply that to God and say, well, anytime thus says the Lord, like, oh, here he goes again. But when you really think about, and I don't mean this derogatory, but you know, when you're a kid, when, when you have a childish way of thinking, of course, whoever is in authority over you, you feel like whatever they're saying to you is negative. You don't like it. Mm -hmm. But once you mature and grow up into adulthood and then you become responsible for somebody else, then you start to understand the role of authority and how parenting or pastoring or whatever it is, obviously God in the scriptures is saying what he's saying out of mercy. He's saying what he's saying out of love yes, for yes. the people. So when you can see that thus says the Lord, although it is a very authoritative phrase, that that's actually an act of mercy towards us. Amen, yes. That 
the worst thing in the world God can do is not talk to us mm. anymore. Yeah. Um, as Romans one says, he can just give us over, um, to our sin and to the, you know, the culture. And so that's the worst thing he can mm-hmm. do. So I can reframe authority saying something to me. It's like, well, at least you love me enough to say it to mm-hmm. me. Yet one of the first verses that anybody ever showed me uh, 15 years ago was Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. Thus says the Lord, mm. heaven is my throne. Yeah. The earth is my footstool. Yeah. Who's going to build a house for me? Exactly. And, and, and that, was, that was so helpful because it was merciful to remind me as an early believer, hey, I'm not God. He is. Yeah, yeah, and I think the, and when you put it this in the broader context, because again, in the Old Testament, God spoke through prophets, you know, and they would use that phrase, thus says the Lord. But then in the book of Hebrews chapter one, and I reference this, I don't know if I reference it in all the messages, but I know I did in a couple. Hebrews one opens up with the statement that in the former days, God spoke to us through prophets Mm -hmm. and priests, but in these last days, he spoke to us through his son. So if we interpret Jesus as the word, as John 1 says, then God sending Jesus is him speaking to us. Mm -hmm. And that is motivated out of his mercy towards us because he didn't have to send Jesus. He didn't have to speak to us. Again, he could have just left us alone. And so that phrase, it just highlighted the fact of this is God being merciful, like the fact that God, if you look throughout human history, the fact that he's been merciful at all mm. to us um, is just incredible. And so I think as believers, we need to learn how to in- reinterpret the commands of God. It's like, well, at least he's still speaking to me. At least he hasn't given up on me. At least he is telling me. Um, and so anyone in authority that is still speaking to me, they're doing it because they love me. Right. Um, I may not like what they're saying, but I don't need to interpret the fact that they at least are taking enough time and consider me worthy enough to at least tell me that. Um, I need to interpret that through a lens of, or they're being merciful to me. Hmm. Um, as Hebrews 12 says, God disciplines those he loves. Yes. And so the act of discipline, although it is not fun, it is mercy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it hurts. It hurts, but it's meant to heal. Yes. Yeah. Thus says the Lord, stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for your souls. Yeah. Yeah, that's the that's the verse. And again, um, this is God speaking to his people. Um, one of my biggest pet peeves, and I mentioned this in the in many, many messages is how people interpret the God of the Old Testament versus the God of the New Testament. He's the same God. But people always say the guy, the God of the Old Testament is mad and the God of the New Testament is nice and, you know, merciful. But again, reinterpreting what I the entire Old Testament through this part is everything that God did and everything that God said in the Old Testament, although to our modern ears may feel really rough, mm-hmm. he was doing it out of a motivation of mercy for us, mm-hmm. so that we would find rest for our souls. Um, and that's what that verse was. He was definitely pronouncing judgments on them, but he was saying, listen, I'm judging you because I want you to change. Right. I want you to change the way you walk. Mm-hmm. And so that became the four-step process, the SLAW, S-L-A-W, stand by the roads, look, ask for where the ancient way is, and walk in it. So that became a way to think about our legacies, that if we don't ever stop long enough, and and I made the point of like, stand by the road, we don't normally stand by roads, we drive on them. Now, obviously, when Jeremiah was written, they didn't have cars, so but they had chariots and other things, but even more so today, like we are busier and faster. We move faster today than any other mm-hmm. time in human history. So it becomes even more necessary for us to stop, to stand by the roads, to look, what direction is my life headed? Mm-hmm. And I made the point out of Hebrews thirteen seven. consider the outcome of, mm-hmm. you know, the way of life. So look and then ask, ask people, ask the Lord. And I love how Jeremiah says that the ancient paths, um, which this was, Jeremiah was written over 2000 years ago. So he's even going further back. Mm-hmm. You know, he's, 
he's getting back into even to creation um, and, and how God worked and the commands God gave. And so he's saying, listen, um, learn from our mistakes. Look back at the ancient, where the good way is. God mm-hmm. has a good way for you. Ask and then walk in it. Mm-hmm. Um, conduct your life in that. And then the promise is you'll find rest for your souls. There's a payoff. Yeah. The, uh, like I said weeks ago, you know, the power's in the promise, mm-hmm. you know. And so God, God makes us so many promises in the Bible. Uh, and then Second Corinthians 1 says all the promises of God are a yes in Jesus. And so everything God promised in the Old Testament, he completed and fulfilled and made available in the New Testament through Jesus. And, and something I really didn't get a chance to dig into the message because I was already like 15 minutes over, which I was trying so hard um, <laughs> to, to get it under. But was that last part, find rest for your souls. Yeah. And we're going to talk more about Sabbath rest in a minute. But that that promise of find rest for our souls, that's what we want. We all want rest. But I think what, what was so f- um, transformative to me to think about in that verse, rest doesn't come just from me taking a break. Like the first two parts of that verse, stand and look, um, rest doesn't just come from me stopping, mm. um, although that's a part of it. So there's a lot of people that, that they think, oh, I can keep living my life dysfunctionally and just take a break every now and then and I'll be fine Mm. or I'll get a vacation and it'll fix it uh, or whatever. Well, what was really interesting to me is in that text, finding rest really comes from knowing my life is heading in the right direction. Yes. That. So therefore the opposite of that, if I don't have rest, if I'm anxious, which that would probably be how we would describe a lack of rest today. I don't have rest in my soul. I'm anxious. I'm busy. I, my soul is, is in turmoil. There's no peace. Well, so you connect these two. If I want rest, which is the opposite of anxiety, then most of my anxiety comes from me not walking in a way that is good. Um, now, again, that's uh, I'm not getting into I'm not saying that anybody who experiences anxiety is directly from a re- result of just sin, because obviously there's brain chemistry and those kinds of things. And that is a legit thing. But what I'm getting at is so much of our life, so much of our anxiousness comes out of living unhealthily. Yeah. Uh, living rhythms that are not that are not good, mm-hmm. as he says. And so we've got to stop long enough, evaluate, look ask, okay, how is a better way to live my life? Mm -hmm. As Chip, one of our pastor mentors, counselors said, can I do what I'm doing for decades? Right. Is this a way of life that I can do Mm -hmm. and live out in a healthy way for decades? And if once I stop, look, ask where the good way is, and I start walking in that, then I'm going to have more rest and I'll have less anxiety because I know the rhythms of my life are healthy and uh, now I'm I'm working in those rhythms from rest, not just trying to rest, get away from those bad rhythms. And and working in those rhythms uh, comes straight from the acronym. So if if you stop and and just take a look, mm-hmm. and then ask somebody, hey, should I be adding this to my plate? Yeah, because so many times, and and I know for me, my lack of rest comes from the inability to say no. Yes. So I've been working on that for two years. There's, mm-hmm. there's actually a book I read at the end of every year called No mm. <laughs> from Doug Fields. Yeah, I love that. And I'm breaking it out next week on our on our break. Oh, good. Uh, to, to read this again, to re-up on this commitment to, st- to say no. But one of the ways you say no is to ask somebody who's doing it the right way yeah. or, or a way that you admire, hey, am I taking on too much here? Mm-hmm. Because... I'm I'm anxious. I'm anxious because my plate is full. Yeah. And yeah, and I think so many people think I thought this in my twenties. Um that well that's just my personality type, or that's just um I, I, I'm just kind of loose, I'm unorgan- unorganized. And I'll never forget sitting down um at our church, my pastor brought in a pastor friend of our of his and was just saying, Listen, or being organized is not a personality type. You know, that's just laziness. Like no matter what you're, and I'm as free flowing as there is, um, 
But I remember then I started changing my schedule because what I would do, kind of to what you were saying, is someone would ask me, hey, can we get coffee or can we hang out? And I would like, my thought was, well, three weeks from now, a month from now, sure, mm -hmm. we can do that then. Right. Because my weeks were so busy now, I didn't have anything scheduled a month from now or six weeks from now. Yep. So I would say yes. Well, then I would get there six weeks from now, and I was just as busy and just as crazy. I'm like, oh, why did I say yes to this? And, and overwhelmed. And overwhelmed. So what I did at that point in time is I, I went through my entire schedule, and I said, okay, I need to figure out what I'm going to be doing on Monday six weeks from now, six months from now. So I segmented my week, and I thought, okay, on Mondays I'm doing this, on Tuesdays I'm doing this, on Wednesdays I'm doing this, on Thursdays I'm doing this. And then I just created blocks of time where mm -hmm. I would meet with people only in these blocks of time. Right. Um, so for me, that's Tuesday, Wednesday afternoon. So once those blocks of time were filled up, it was like, well, you got to wait six weeks or you got to wait two months. Mm -hmm. and, and I gave that block to my assistant then, and then even now this is how I do things. Because on Wednesday morning, six months from now, I know what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be studying for a message. Right. So I need to decide ahead of time what mm. I'm going to say yes to um, and not just think, oh, in the future, I'll have more time because mm -hmm. you're going to get there and you won't. Yeah. So, yeah, you have to be intentional about what you say yes to, what you say no to. Um, and again, that comes from, yeah, mm -hmm. asking people, learning, man, this is not a good way to live. Yeah, um, look at the consequences of saying yes. Yeah. Uh, one of the most helpful things for me was somebody told me, when you say yes to some, something or someone, you're saying no to someone else. Absolutely. And in my case, it's generally my wife. Mm -hmm. And and I've made some some decisions over the last couple of years to not give my wife crumbs. Yeah. Yeah, but again, that's being intentional. And, and that was a word that I was trying to put into some acronym last week, you know, um, trying to get the word intentional in there. Um, but the whole process is being intentional because yeah, that, and that's what, and a lot of pastors and ministers have to go through this and experience it because early on in our ministry, we want to help everybody. Oh, I'm, I'm, I was terrible at saying no. Yeah, me too. I was too. Um, because people would ask me, Hey, can you do this on Friday? Can you do this on Saturday? Like I was joking with Lindsay a few weeks ago because I'm super extroverted. And so early in ministry, we, we would have church, and I would want to go out to eat with lunch, to lunch with somebody every week. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but Lindsay um, wanted to go home and have, because that's what her family did growing up. Mm -hmm. So she would want to have lunch at home with our family. And I, for the first year or two, I was like, oh, we didn't get to go out to eat lunch with somebody today. But then now, 20 years in, I, I joked with her the other day, I was driving home on a Sunday so tired, and I said, I can't fathom going to eat lunch with anybody right now <laughs> because I just want to go home right. and, and rest mm -hmm. and recharge. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, in my early years, I was really immature to think, oh, I could just go on. I'm the Energizer Bunny. I can do this forever. Mm -hmm. um, but I couldn't. I couldn't keep that pace forever. And so now it is recognizing, yeah, there are times where there are times where I will say yes to, to people, and then there were times I will say yes to my family mm -hmm. or to myself or to the Lord. Um, and you got to build that in. You know, again, that's where I love how Jeremiah says it, the, where the good way is. Mm -hmm. So you got to think through, and that's part of what Sabbath is intentional. Sabbath isn't just about resting once a week, although it is, which we'll get into those steps. It's also about thinking about what did I do the other six weeks? And do I want to do that again the next six weeks? Right. Or the six days. Right. Sorry. Um, how was my schedule these last six days? Do I want my schedule like that the next six days? Or do I need to change that? Creating boundaries, setting perimeters so that I'm not running into a Sabbath day of rest so worn out that it I don't get any time to think mm -hmm. or contemplate. Yeah. The... If you're listening right now, the long-term benefits of being a part of Revolution Church and having uh, your pastor actively and intentionally looking at these things, not just for himself, but for the entire church, is, is going to be life-giving to you. Yeah, like I was just meeting with my one of my mentors last week who is 69, about to be 70, and he's the one who came up with the phrase that we say on here all the time, trust God and take a nap. And he just told me, he said, because I was really like the day that we met, 
I didn't have any questions to ask. I was so tired because mm-hmm. Lindsay just had surgery and there's you know, been a lot of events going on at church and speaking. And, and so, uh, it was just kind of like, Hey, I'm just here. And he was, so he was just kind of talking to me and he said, Jason, um, being sleep deprived is not something you can make up for. Um, and he, and I don't remember where he said it from. He said, but if someone is sleep deprived, it literally takes you like a year to get that sleep back. Mm-hmm. And he said, cause I'm 43, he's almost 70. And he said, Jason, the reason why I'm still in ministry at 69 and still have more in my tank and still want to keep serving in this capacity that I'm in is because back in my forties, I didn't go, go, go. I didn't burn myself out. I said, no, I took naps. I lived my life. And he said, so many times we do everything that we think is important because if we don't do it, someone's going to leave or someone's going to get upset. And he was like, but if people are still coming to your church and then obviously what you're doing is working, you don't have to say yes to everything. Mm -hmm. You can say no because if you don't say no now, you won't even have the capacity to say yes when you're 70. That's right. And that's what we're talking about mm-hmm. is, is yeah, learning to have that rhythm of rest where, um, like I was thinking this morning, there's so many things in my life now that I, w- that I look back on 20 years or 30 years and I'm like, man, I wish I would have said no to that. Yes. I wish I would have said yes to this. Yep. Uh, I wish I would have invested in tesla stock or whatever it is you know <laughs> um well the the question that we're asking in this series is saying okay what 20 years from now mm-hmm. are you going to look back and say you wish you would have said no to now amen so say no to it now knowing that 20 years from now you're going to thank yourself mm. you're going to benefit from the decisions you made now and generations after you're going to benefit so i appreciate what you said but yeah that's why i'm trying to lead our church into this because there's a lot of things that are important and and we have a vision that is generational that I want to spend the next, you know, 30 years of my life giving my life to, but I got 30 years, Yeah, you know, I don't, we're not going to accomplish it all now. Mm -hmm. We don't, I I don't feel the weight to accomplish it all now. And that's part of why we're taking a Sabbath as a church, because it reminds us, Hey, we're, we are not machines. We are Mm -hmm. human beings created in the image of God who. He wants us to rest to remind us that he's the infinite source, not us. Um, and so, yeah, we're trying to build this rhythm in as a church because I want our church to be healthy five years from now. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's because we develop rhythms and patterns now. Human beings as opposed to... Human doings, yeah. And that's why being with God... Absolutely. And having that intentional time with God. And... And, and I'm glad you brought it up. You've got 30 years. I don't know how many years I have left. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm 60, and, and I'd like to think i got 15 more solid years in ministry, mm-hmm. but that ain't going to happen if I don't look at this right now. Absolutely. Because in 15 years, I don't want to look back and say, I've got nothing in the tank because of the last 15 years. Yeah, yeah. And you, I mean, you, you had a, you know, you were working multiple jobs for a lot of years, and and it took you a long time to come off of that adrenaline, you know, of almost two years. Yeah. Waking up so early and mm-hmm. then working late at church, you know, that kind of stuff. And so, yeah, that's when, and, and I knew it was time for us to make that transition too. Cause mm-hmm. you know, we, um, we wanted you more full time here. Um, but it was also beneficial to you to say, we're buying you out of what you were doing there mm-hmm. because, I knew, you knew, we had that conversation. You yep. can't keep running like mm-hmm. that. Um, mm-hmm. and, and and when you're in it, you don't know it. No, no. And again, that was week one of the Leading the Legacy series, the overview effect mm-hmm. of we got to stop long enough. And the most transformative thing when the astronauts went to the moon was not seeing the moon. It was turning back and looking at the earth mm. and seeing that. Wow. And so, so many times in our life, we're always so focused on where we're headed that we never take time to stop and look back at where we came from and say, well, am I proud of that? Is that the legacy? That Because that is my legacy. Is mm-hmm. that what I want to leave? Yeah. And I always thought, and I used to tell Lindsay this so often, I'm like, oh, when we get to this level, it'll be, it'll change. <laughs> yeah. When we get here, it'll change. Right. Well, it won't. No. Um, because in church world, even, like as the bigger the church grows, the more complex it is and the harder it is. Mm-hmm. So now it's like I long for the simple days. 
But in those simple days is when I was making promises to my wife that when we got bigger, it would be better. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. The, that's the fallacy of the thinking. Right. It's like, no, it's going to get better when I choose to make it better, no matter how big it is. Yeah. You, you can't wait for things to slow down. No. No, you have to slow it down. Yeah. So let, let's take a look at the what really quick, and then we'll get into the why a little deeper. So the what is, uh, this past Sunday, we had an online gathering only, mm-hmm. and then... This coming Sunday, there won't be any gatherings at all, yeah. online or uh, or in person. And that is part of the intentional Sabbath rest. Our office is closed this week. So that's the that's the what. But yes. the why is so much more important. Yeah, we're taking what, what we call or what we're calling just a Sabbath Sunday. And um, and the point of it is we just ended one year, we're starting another one, and we want people to stop you know, and actually practice what we talked about, stand by the roads, look, um, and have a, a, a chance to really contemplate. And so um, we talked about this in the end of the year gathering, but Pete Scazzaro, who wrote Emotionally Healthy Discipleship, who we all went through as a staff, talks about the four steps to mm-hmm. um, what a Sabbath is. So you stop, you rest, you delight, and you contemplate. And so again, the why to what your point is, um, why we need to stop and rest. So, so many times we think of Sabbath as just the first two, stop and rest. Right. So I just need to rest. I just need to lay down. And this is how I thought. So I just watch a bunch of TV or just kind of check out or veg out, <clears throat> which is not necessarily bad, but that's not the why of mm-hmm. what we're doing. Sure. The why is we are reconnecting with God. We are reconnecting to our source, you know, the most practical way I can say it is we all have electronics now. Well, when we plug them into the wall, they get charged and we unplug it and then we go out and use it all day Well, the battery drains. Well, if that's true of a phone, that's true of us. Yes. So God built us. We have to rest mm-hmm. every day. So we're recharging. But resting is more than just my body. It is my soul reconnecting with God. Uh, again, the, the idea of plugging back into my power source. So... The why is so that we can take time to delight in God. Mm. We can delight in who he is, the gifts he's given us, his mercy towards us, the fact that he's still speaking to us. And if we don't have a rhythm of delighting in God, that is where he's, our souls are resting in him. We are, we are being filled up by him. Um, and then we are contemplating God in our life and our week. And then if we don't have a rhythm where we're doing that weekly, that we're going to run out of, we're going to run out of gas real fast, Mm -hmm. you know, because we're not delighting in God. Mm -hmm. We are not spending time with the one that our souls were made for. Um, So that's the, the why behind it. And you can feel that, you know, that if, you know, you're anxious and you're exhausted and you just go, 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 go. And you stop for a second, go, have I been in the word? Yeah. Have I spent any time with God? And, and I'm not talking about the one minute prayer in the parking lot before you walk into work. Uh, I'm talking about just taking time and just being. Absolutely. No. And, and again, we live so fast. Uh, I was listening to a pastor I respect who lives in New York City, and he said that they psychologists have done a study that when you live in New York, it actually affects the speed in which you walk. You actually start walking faster. Mm-hmm. Your normal walk becomes faster because living in New York City, you walk everywhere, so everybody walks fast. So people who live in New York City walk faster than people who live in Canton because of the culture they're in. And what he talked about was, well, if, if the city we live in has a, an effect on how fast we literally walk, then how much of our culture is affecting how we live? Yeah. You know? And so, yeah, we have to um, recognize that, like slow down, stop, and and even like you said, reading the Bible, uh, every morning uh, when I open my phone, the first app that I open is the Bible app. I look at the verse of the day. And that's just a quick hit, mm-hmm. you know, 30 seconds, a minute, maybe. Um, but that's not enough, you know. So even though I have a good rhythm of opening up my Bible app every day, and mainly because I don't want the streak that I have to go away, I'm just being honest. Um <laughs> But yeah, if I don't take a, a day a week to actually dig in more, to actually, and, and I would even say not even electronically, not on my phone, mm-hmm. you know, but getting the Bible, a book, sitting with it, 
and just reading it and then meditating on it and then thinking how this, what this tells me about my need and God's glory, you know, and about who he is and who I am. And I consciously become aware that there is a living God who loves me and is for me and is filling me and wants to. Then my one minute a day on my Bible app is not going to sustain me. Right. right. Um, and, and that's one beauty of my job is I, I you know, I, I preach the Bible, so I have to study the Bible. Um, so sometimes it's a benefit to me because I get time during my work week to study the Bible, but it actually can become a even more of a, of a challenge yes. because yes. I read the Bible for my work. Right. So that when I'm off, I don't want to read it anymore. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, that is very, very dangerous very. to my right. soul mm -hmm. because I'm no longer reading it for myself. Mm -hmm. um, I'm reading it for others. Well, that's why a lot of pastors start becoming really shallow people mm -hmm. because they quit reading the word for themselves a long mm -hmm. time ago. Yeah. Um, and so, again, that's part of why we do this Sabbath because we want, like, it's not a bad thing for the church to gather together to hear a message. You know, but that's the word of God from me to them. But by doing a Sabbath Sunday like this, we're saying, no, 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 no. We're cutting out the middleman. This is for you to hear from God, from you, for mm -hmm. yourself, from him. Um, now, again, there's a role to preaching. Uh, I mean, that's what I do. I'm not saying it's bad. Mm -hmm. But if the only time I'm ever hearing from God is from another man or woman's mouth, right? then that's not enough. Yeah. Because um, you're getting my interpretation of that you're getting my you know um study on that and so which is why our groups are set up the way they are to dig into those verses the way they talk about it you know the reap method all that kind of stuff but we just wanted to intentionally say hey at the beginning of a new year we want you to start this year out from a place of rest mm -hmm. not having to worry about getting ready coming to church that whole deal um but but be at home with the Lord yourself. Yeah. And we're going to continue in January uh, pursuing rest, pursuing that time with our 21 days of prayer and fasting, yeah. uh, our season normally called Abide. And uh, what, what is so valuable what, about what Pastor Jason is, is sharing is, and we shared it on, on Sunday in the online gathering, uh, we're, not, we're not real good at rest. <laughs> <laughs> we're, not, we're not good at at looking at who God is, he's the only one who doesn't need sleep or rest. Yeah. Uh, there's only one that does and it ain't, it ain't us. Yeah. So, uh, we're not good at it. I'm not good at it. I'm, I've been terrible at it for the first 59 and a half years. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and now pursuing rest, I, I was able to go away for a couple of days last week, mm. uh, which is rare. Yeah. And, and that's my fault. <laughs> that's that's definitely my fault for for not getting that time, but uh, there was a twenty four hour period where I really felt for the first time I had checked out, mm. maybe since March eleventh, twenty twenty. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. And and I had taken time off since then, but, of course. And it was sitting intentionally, like you said when you said it. I was like, oh, that was it. Sitting intentionally. I was just reading a book that Pastor Chad turned us on to called Gentle and Lowly mm -hmm. uh, from Dane Ortland, And the first chapter really unpacked simply uh, Matthew 11, come to me, yeah, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. Mm -hmm. And I realized I hadn't mm -hmm. in a long time. Yeah. No, and, and that's the, again, there's a promise there. I will give you rest, but there's also a process mm -hmm. at the front of it. Well, if I don't do the process, I'll never get the promise. Mm -hmm. If I don't come to him, mm -hmm. I will not receive rest. So that's what we're saying. And in Jeremiah 6, 16, slaw, you know, that whole thing, standing, looking, asking, that is us coming to him. Mm -hmm. um, and, I think the operative word that you said there at the beginning, which is important, um, you said it was your fault. Um, cause it is, yeah. you know, and I'm not saying that derogatory. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I recognize that. But, but the moment you took responsibility for it, that you hadn't done it and then you did it, then God met with you. Mm. And I think that's the point is 
if I'm not willing to take responsibility for something, then I'm delaying God meeting with me. Wow. Um, and so many people in our culture are blaming other people mm -hmm. for their lack of rest or their lack of whatever, their high anxiety levels. Well, so, well, that's on you. You know, I told our staff years ago, and several of our staff didn't like it when I said it. But I said, hey, if you get to the end of the year and you haven't taken all your vacation days, that's mm -hmm. your fault. Right. And we actually had staff like, hey, will you pay us for unused vacation days? I said, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. I will not. I will not pay you for not doing something that I wanted you to do. Mm, that's good. Why would I pay you for right. that? Why would I give you extra for that? Right. I want you to take vacations. Mm -hmm. I want you to take rest. Um, so why would I reward you not doing that? Mm -hmm. And and I made a comment one year that said, if you get to the end and you haven't taken vacations, that's on you. And and a couple people were upset, and well, it's just fine. We talked through it. But the point that I was trying to make to them is like, well, if you – because the, the idea was, or the response was, well, I can't take a break because there's no one here to do my job. It was like, well, then that's the problem. Right. You haven't multiplied yourself. That's right. You haven't, you haven't raised up other people. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't have time for that. Well, that is your job. Yes. We didn't hire you to do mm -hmm. stuff. We hired you to equip people mm -hmm. to do stuff. That's the essence of ministry. And so um, as one person told me, if you replace yourself, you become irreplaceable. That's right. And, and that's the point of ministry, mm -hmm. which is a point of legacy. Right. I'm trying to replace myself. But we all had this fear of like, well, no, if I replace myself, I'm working myself out of a job. They're going to mm -hmm. get rid of me. No. no, any smart leader says, oh, if you replaced yourself, I'm going to keep you because you just multiplied your impact. That's right. Um, and so, again, going back to the point of like, we got to take responsibility for that. Mm -hmm. No one can take responsibility for me not having rest Besides me. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, we all work. We work 40 hours, 50 hours, 60 hours, whatever it is. But um, but if when I'm home or when I'm off, if I'm not being intentional about slowing down, looking, asking, walking, that's on me. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so many people have ruined their lives from a lack of rest because they simply won't take responsibility. And that's all we're trying to say. And then we'll never get to the promise. No, never get to the promise because um, they were living their life redlining and then blaming someone else that they crashed. Um, so burnout is a real thing. Yep. Um, but burnout doesn't come from doing too much. Burnout more than likely comes from I'm over-functioning in one area and under-functioning in another. Mm. And so I'm living my life without replenishing resources over here. So I'm living my life on E. Well, it shouldn't be a, it shouldn't be a surprise to me that I ran out right. of gas because mm -hmm. I wasn't refilling myself over here. Mm -hmm. So again, I don't mean that to be derogatory at all to you or any of our listeners, but to say we've got to take responsibility. Oh, absolutely. And that's what happened. You took responsibility, you went away, you rested, and God met with you. Mm. Um, that's the promise. Amen. So we have four parts to slaw, and there are four parts to Sabbathing. Mm -hmm. So let's wrap it up with those. Yeah. So again, they fit together. Um, the Pete Scazzaro, Emotionally Healthy Discipleship, said to, to Sabbath, the four parts to a Sabbath is stopping, resting, delighting, contemplating. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the parts to a Sabbath. And what I would say is, the slaw is kind of bigger picture. That's about my whole direction of my life, mm -hmm. where I stand, I look, I ask, and I walk. Um, so I would put Sabbath, those four parts, really as a, as a part of the first two of slaw. Mm -hmm. Stopping and looking. So in those two things, what I'm doing is stopping, resting, delighting in God, contemplating. And then that leads me, then I'm asking other people, and then I'm walking in it. So that's how they at least in my mind, fit together ab about a process of what we're trying to help people to start doing in their life. Yep. Um, so the four parts of Sabbathing is something that I should do weekly and how I Sabbath. And then slaw is something that I should either do maybe quarterly or, you know, year yearly at least to think about the direction of my life and how I'm living in the ways, you know, I'm considering the outcomes of how I'm living is my pattern worth repeating? All that kind of stuff. And so these are big, you know, epistemological questions that mm -hmm. we're dealing with here. Um, and we want people to think about um, 
But what we're saying is you'll never do that if you're not resting, you're yeah. not Sabbathing, mm-hmm. because you, you're not stopping long enough to actually consider anything. Um, so that's what we want people to do and how I would fit it together. So uh, I know we've gone a little longer in, in today's podcast, but I think it was absolutely worth it uh, because this is life-giving. How do, how do people uh, avoid becoming uh, legalistic with regard to Sabbathing? Uh, I would say um, we become legalistic when we start telling people they should do it the way we're doing it, mm-hmm. not the fact that we are doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, so we become legalistic when we tell people, well, here is the way I do it, so it is the way to do it. Right. Instead, we should say, no, you need to do it, but here's a way to do it. Mm-hmm. You don't have to do it my way, but you need to do it. Right. Um, so, yeah, I think legalistic is when we start... Um, when I, when I start demanding to other people that they live the way I'm living, mm-hmm. because I'm assuming that the way I'm living is right and godly. Mm-hmm. And so therefore, if you're living it my way, you're like Jesus, you know, mm-hmm. and that just becomes, as Tim Keller says there, you know, we can look at our life thinking about legacy, like, and, and we may look at, like in the area of finances and say, man, I've been really smart in this area. I've made some smart decisions, which is good. But if we're not careful, that can go real quick from I made some smart decisions to I'm smarter than you. Mm. Um, and you're in your life, you're in the place you're in because you've made bad decisions right. and you're dumb. Well, that's pharisaical. Mm-hmm. When we start thinking, when we go one level up and start saying, no, I didn't make smart decisions, but I made smart decisions because I'm smart. You made some dumb decisions because you're dumb. Mm-hmm. That's a Pharisee. As opposed to saying, man, by the grace of God, you know, he, I was able to make some smart decisions. Thank goodness hmm. that he showed me that I learned. Right. That I, and then we approach it like that with other people mm-hmm. to say, hey, you can make these decisions too. Right. You know, so don't let it roll up to a level mm-hmm. of thinking of, oh, I'm really smart. Well, by the grace of God, you just made some smart decisions. Mm-hmm. You know, you listened. Um, and without that, you would have been a train wreck too. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, and we've we've been to Israel, um, and we've seen how how Sabbath plays out. Yeah, um, in in Israel, uh, w- to the point where there's an elevator. Yeah, the in, Sabbath elevator in in the hotel, which you can't press a button. Yeah, it, it just goes it. to every floor. Yeah, and, and because pressing the button creates an electrical current, which would be considered work. Work like me pressing it is working. Yeah, I think they missed the point. The point is not I can't press a button. But and that's where it's funny to me. It's like, well, but you like at the hotels we say that. They mm-hmm. drove their cars, they got to they packed their bags, mm-hmm. they got all that was work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. The point is not I can't press a button or I can't pack a bag. The point is I need to just interrupt my weekly routine mm-hmm. and stop and rest and contemplate and delight in God. That's the point. Um so yeah, you can definitely take it to the nth degree the other way. Mm-hmm. Well, fascinating look at uh, why we're taking a Sabbath rest. Um, It's life-giving. It's for the rhythm of the next five to ten years of Mm -hmm. not just the church, but for all of us. And we have have seen this practice play out in our own lives. When we're not practicing Sabbathing, when we're not practicing intentional rest, it doesn't go well. No, because again, if you think about, you know, Sunday is the first day of the week, and... Um, they moved, the early Christians moved Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday so that it wasn't ending a week, it was beginning a week. And and the point was now we're working from rest. Jesus finished it. He said it is finished. Mm-hmm. Now I'm working from that, as opposed to Sabbathing at the end of the week, which was I'm working to that. So Christianity flips it, and and that's what we want. We don't want people to work all week and then run into rest. Mm. We want people to rest and then from their rest, go work. That's good. That's good. Great way to end. We, we did go a little long, but you're probably off this week and you're probably resting. Yeah, so hopefully. you have plenty more time to listen to the podcast. Yeah. And, and or you can listen to this during church. <laughs> what would have been church on January 2nd? Yes. Yeah. Not, not during church. Not yeah, when you're no, sitting yeah. in church. Yeah, exactly. Yes. How do we end every podcast? Perfect way to do today's Yeah, trust God and take a nap. Trust God, take a nap. Thank you, Pastor Jason. Thank you.